Hello, my name is Misha Slade, and I'll be guiding you through this PowerPoint presentation. The to topic I've chosen to discuss with you today is theories of teaching and learning. The objectives I'd like to pose to you today and things I'd like you to consider while reviewing this PowerPoint, as well as the rest of the web page, include distinguishing differences between each theorist that is presented to you today. There are many theories out there, and I've only selected a few to introduce to you. With that knowledge, I'd like you to evaluate which theory suits you best in your learning and teaching. Then, it's only beneficial if the knowledge gained is actually used. So, using the information, I encourage you to devise plans to better teach your students. You may teach young children or you may teach adults. Either way, understanding learning and teaching theories will help you better prepare. I'd like to give you a brief background of B.F. Skinner. He was born March 20, 1904 in Pennsylvania. His father was a lawyer and his mother stayed home. He grew up as a normal, hard-working young child. His goal in life was to be a writer and he received a bachelor's degree in English from Hamilton College in New York. His success as a fictional writer was not as promising as he had hoped and he decided to go back to school after some time and travel. At that point, he received a master's and a doctoral degree from Harvard in psychology. He moved around a bit, teaching and researching for various universities, and he died in 1990 of leukemia. Skinner studied behaviors and created theories to change these behaviors. This is both learning and teaching. The learner changes their behaviors, and their teacher actually works to keep or change the desired behavior. One of his main theories is called operant conditioning. Basically, an action takes place, and a reinforcement for that action occurs after the behavior. The reinforcement provides for an increased probability that the participant will behave the same way in the future. He used pigeons and rats to learn about operant conditioning, but after some time discontinued using rats and only used pigeons. Through these experiments, he also learned that he could schedule reinforcement successfully. He also discovered shaping to be a great way to achieve more complex behaviors. This involves reinforcing a behavior similar to the behavior desired. In my own opinion, it seems very similar to scaffolding, which is done in the classroom. Skinner explains how he once used shaping with his daughter to get her to go down the slide. She was too scared to go alone, so he started at the bottom of the slide and asked her to stand and then jump to him. He continued to move her up the slide, each time asking her if she felt comfortable and then to jump to him. In the end, she was at the top of the slide and comfortable sliding down to him. Through all of his studies, his wife knew he enjoyed working with gadgets and solving problems. So one day, she asked him to invent a crib that babies would not get stuck in or suffocate from the blanket. He created an enclosed and heated crib with plexiglass windows, the baby tender. As his daughters were growing older, he decided to attend one of their math talks. He sat in the back of the room and was appalled at the teaching and the learning process. Students were required to do full pages of math before they knew if they'd done any of the problems incorrectly. Now, he didn't blame the teacher because she didn't know any better and yet and there was a whole class full of students. How was she supposed to check the work so quickly? He went home and he constructed his first teaching machine. The machine presented problems in random order for students to complete and then there was feedback after each problem. Within the next three years, he even adapted the machine so the students could give feedback and through scaffolding, the students could learn skills that were more complex. Carl Rogers was born on January 8, 1902 in Illinois, just outside Chicago. His father was a civil engineer and, like Skinner, his mother stayed home. Interesting enough, Carl Rogers moved right to the second grade because he could already read before kindergarten. That doesn't happen too much these days, right? He grew up on a farm and therefore became very self-disciplined as a youth. His higher education began at the University of Wisconsin where he planned to major in agriculture. However, he later decided to change his major to religion in hopes of becoming a minister. While in this major, he was chosen to travel to China for six months for a study abroad type program. While in China, he started to doubt his religious views. He still graduated and he married, against his parents' wishes, a lady and they moved to New York City. He took classes in New York and one of them was called, Why Are You Entering the Ministry? Interesting enough, most of the students checked themselves out of the ministry field upon completion of the class. He 
He then moved to Columbia University and worked for his PhD in clinical psychology. After working at various universities and writing books, he concluded his days in a research position in La Jolla, California and died in 1987. In his research, Rogers came up with the theory that teachers should be facilitators. The facilitator basically allows the group to develop and find new ideas through study rather than being told what to learn. The facilitator helps the group to feel comfortable and non-threatened. Some of the components of the theory include the idea that humans are eager to learn and that learning involves changing yourself concepts. Now, this theory also deals with both the learner and the teacher or facilitator. The learner has a responsibility to learn and is encouraged to take that responsibility upon themselves. This allows the learner to have a stronger self-concept. The learner is encouraged to share insight and personal experiences that will allow for others to relate, to le relate and learn. And finally, the learner is encouraged to reflect and solve problems. The facilitator is more of a listener than a teacher. The facilitator guides the discussion through relationships and content, however both are equally important, and the facilitator also provides feedback to the group, both positive and negative, in hopes they will listen, reflect, and problem solve. Robert Gagne was born in Massachusetts in 1916. He earned a bachelor's degree from Yale in 1937 and a PhD from Brown in 1940. With this education and knowledge, he went on to teach psychology and educational psychology at various universities across the United States. He also worked as a research director for the Air Force and was employed as a consultant to the Department of Defense and the U.S. Office of Education. His research changed education as well as military training. While Gagne worked with the military, he discovered instruction was not suitable for the necessity of what needed to be taught, so he started to study principles related to positive instruction and came up with the conditions of learning theory. This theory basically states that there are different types of learning and different types of instruction are needed for each learning style. The conditions of learning theory include five categories of learning as seen on this slide. Teachers or facilitators are encouraged to take each of these categories and teach directly to them in their own way of learning. Therefore, this theory, like the others, also reaches learners and teachers. Teachers, or facilitators, must know strategies and implement those strategies depending on how each student or participant learns. Along with the five conditions of learning come nine instructional events for teaching and facilitating. These events should reach all of your learners in some way or another. I find it interesting, as a teacher, that this is basically how a positive and productive lesson plan plays out. First, we have to gain attention, usually with some type of charismatic attention driver. Then we explain our objective. That step was always hard for me to remember and even see the necessity, but I do realize adults and children will learn better when they see there is a reason or outcome for the learning. Finding the prior knowledge or bias is important to see how learners can relate. The information to be taught is then presented, either verbal or physical. Then comes the scaffolding through guidance and performance. Feedback is essential, and quick feedback is even more essential. If learners do not receive immediate or almost immediate feedback, the learning is hindered and sometimes one must start over. Assessment drives instruction, and this step is essential to determine if reteaching needs to be implemented for retention. Robert Gagne's theory goes into even more detail regarding eight distinctive types of learning. Click on the link below for a more detailed review and additional information regarding the types of learning. Which theory suits you? Think about this before you jump to answer. I've thought a great deal about this question and for some reason, I can't find a perfect answer. Each theory makes sense to me. Each theory has positive proponents and as a teacher and parent, I've seen each theory work. Take time to consider the option that all theories are correct. We just need to implement them into our teaching and facilitating.